and fill the paper with the message that it wants to send. We're going to get into a little bit more about your writing. Cherie L. Smith, the author of the September discussion book for Aviation Books Club, um, Fly Girl, and she's written at least nine other books, uh, and most of them are young adult fiction or, or children's fiction. Or actually, that's not true. A range of young adults and children's fiction and nonfiction. Is that more accurate? That, that is more accurate, yeah. Okay, okay. So Cherie, how did you become a writer? How did I become a writer? Um, you know, somebody put a book in my hands when I was a kid and I became a reader. And then when I was 10, my mom gave me a, uh, a journal and I decided that it would become my first novel. <laughs> and I wrote three pages and I would, she was making dinner and I would run in after each page and read it out loud to her and then run back and write some more. And on the third reading, I realized that I was plagiarizing a book that I loved <laughs> as a kid by Lloyd Alexander. So I gave up and I, and I didn't try to write another novel for, you know, like another 10 years, but which then was also terrible and I didn't do anything with that. I, it took a long time to learn to write novels, but I've been writing short stories and the like since um, elementary school and eighth grade. And then, you know, publishing what I just went back and read is some really truly terrible poetry in the high school literary magazine, but felt like a huge accomplishment at the time. But then becoming like a, 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 a published author it was a different journey. I'd been, I'd been trying to publish short stories and, and not having a lot of traction. And then I took this trip to Alaska. Um, I was working as a, as a development executive, a story development executive at Disney TV Animation. So my job was to come up with stories for animated feature films that went straight to home video. And um, one of our writers lived in Alaska and he said, come up and visit. And when I was up there, I was taking notes, like, you know, like a travel journal, but on a legal pad of what I was seeing. And one of his friends took me on this tour of, um, of Juneau and we stopped in front of this totem pole at the University of Alaska. And she was telling me a story about these kids she used to teach. And she sighed and said, ah, oh, Lucy the giant, which was one of the girls in her program. And she said those words and a bell went off in my head. And I said, what did you say? And she said, Lucy the giant. And I heard gong. And I said, say that one more time. And every time she said it, it gonged. So I wrote it down and didn't think anything else of it. And now I'm on one of the ferries in Alaska. And after that terrifying trip in the little plane up to Skagway, I took a ferry down to Sitka. And on that plane, this woman in the cafe, on that uh, fairy, this woman in the cafeteria comes over to me and I'm just writing down what I'm seeing on my legal pad. And she comes over and she goes, excuse me, are you a writer? And I said, no. And she's like, but you're writing. And I'm like, I'm also it. on a boat, but I'm not like a boater. Like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> but it was on that trip that I realized that not only was I a writer, but that um, the notes I had been taking were the notes for my first novel, which is called Lucy the Giant, as it turns out. So um, that's how it started. That is a fabulous story. Have you ever um, read Elizabeth Gilbert's Big Magic? I haven't, I've heard her speak about it though. And, There's just yeah. this one little excerpt of it where she talks about ideas being these living, breathing creatures that are flitting around the world looking for a partner and that they come to you. and and if you're paying attention, and if it's the right time for you, then, you know, you get together and you work on something. And I, I just, think it's very true. I've had that experience myself multiple times. And so I totally relate to your Lucy the Giant story. That's so cool. So how did you hone your craft? You talk about Fly Girl being a master's thesis, what mm -hmm. masters were you working on and where, and how did that program help you? So, um, yeah, I'll start back with like, I think my first creative writing class was in college um, and was a terrible attempt at a novel that never went anywhere because I didn't understand not how to write a novel. I understood how to read a novel, but so much of your training in school is for writing short stories that writing a full, you know, a, a longer form piece of fiction is a mystery. So I hadn't figured that out yet. And 
uh, around the same time that I started writing uh, Lucy the Giant, my mom, God bless her, who always supported me in everything I wanted to do, she gave me some books on writing that she picked up at a yard sale. And, and I'm looking at this fusty book that I was just like, it smells like an old garage thing and I don't really want this. Uh, and it fell open on a page that said, if you want to write short stories, write short stories. If you want to write novels, write novels. And my head exploded because I'd been writing short stories and people would say, that's a lot, that sounds like a novel. But I'd be like, well, it's not though because I don't know how to do a novel, so. And so then I realized that um, writing is like baking and short stories are cookies. I love chocolate chip cookies it, and a novel is like baking a wedding cake. It's the same basic concept, a lot of the same ingredients, but a novel's got structure. It's got layers, it's got a lot more going on. And so then I started dedicating myself to figuring that out. So I, I took another short story class, um, UCLA Extension, and that was, you know, it's useful for crafting sentences, but ultimately it's not gonna help you with long form. Um, my time at Disney taught me a lot about three act structure. So um, I left Disney, like after I had my Alaska epiphany, um, it took me a little while, but I finally I quit that job, um, got a temping job down at the um, at LAX at the airport um, for a construction company. So I worked in a triple wide trailer on the side of the runway. Oh, and we might have been neighbors. <laughs> probably, probably. Because I was, like I was right lonely... between the runways. <laughs> that's probably, that's exactly. I was, I, and you, you would find me sitting on a metal staircase eating my sandwich, my little bag lunch. And then when everybody else went to lunch, I had to man the fort. So while they were gone, I started writing my novel on the backs of discarded Xerox copies and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I guess airplanes are always in the background, literally. <laughs> I just never really thought about it. Fly, Fly Girl, I had decided um, I needed a backup career. I, 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 like I had this, this um, conversation with a girlfriend who had just gotten divorced and was at odds, didn't know what she was going to do. And I was like, oh, you know, I never wanted to be a teacher, but maybe I should get a master's so that I can teach if I have to. And so I got a master's of arts in uh, the humanities with a concentration in creative writing because I couldn't afford the MFA programs that were out there at the time and I couldn't afford to go to school full time. So I was able to do a distance learning program at Cal State uh, Dominguez Hills. Um, and I chose the program also because my graduate thesis could be a creative work. And I started writing Fly Girl. Um, that was, I was stuck in traffic at the time, all that came together. And I had this thought that if I could write a book off of this degree, it would pay for the degree. <laughs> Wouldn't that be wonderful, you know? Uh, you know, state school tuitions and uh, being what they are. And so I worked on it with, a, uh, my advisor was uh, Dr. Abe Rabbits, who when I pitched him the idea, he wrote me and he said, you know, Shree, I served in World War II and I've never heard of these women. He had never heard of the Women's Air Force Service Plan. Oh, wow. So that while I was there, my thesis is actually only a section of the novel. Plus there was like a critical element to the thesis. So it's about 50 pages of the book and it covers that time period when Ida Mae goes home after training, but before deployment. Yeah. And so it was lovely to be able to work with someone who had served in the war you know, to give me feedback. And he was like, dig into the pathos, make us feel, make us, you know, yeah. um, so that, that is what helped me there. But then I had to write the rest of it without him. And there's, it should still be in the books today. There's like a tiny little uh, acknowledgement in the beginning, thanking him for like a little dedication um, somewhere in the very beginning. I was surprised. I said, can I put a dedication in there? And the way they put it in was so tiny that I was like, oh. I well, my book it. is my book is the original copy that I've had since 2009. So I guarantee it's in here. Many so thanks it's... to Professor A. Bravitz for overseeing <laughs> the seedling version of this novel and to my manager, Garrett Hicks, for recognizing this story would become. Yep. Yes. Yep. Cool. Yay. So that's, <laughs> that's the seeds of, of Fly Girl. Okay, so you wrote it, and um, did you have, well, so you, you had already published a book then? Fly Girl is my fourth novel. Fourth. Did you have an agent yeah. already? 
So um, Garrett Hicks, who's thanked in there, he Man. said that the, the funny story is so I was working in development at Disney TV animation and Garrett was working in development at uh, Disney features animation. And we met each other. And then when I quit uh, Disney, um, you know, I told the world I'm quitting to go write books for young people, um, which was a different process of like realizing that's where I was going to start my writing career. And he called me one day. He said, why didn't you tell me you were leaving to write for kids? And I was sort of like, why would I? <laughs> I don't know. We, we are acquaintances. It didn't occur to me. And he goes, well, I'm leaving to represent children's authors. Wow. Kismet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So we had lunch and um, we agreed he'd represent me. And let's see, I, I can't remember if I had finished, I hadn't finished Lucy the Giant yet. I wrote Lucy the Giant over the course of the fastest novel I've ever written, the course of like eight months and gave it to him and he sold it within two months. And, wow. Wow. and then it just seemed like, well, this is easy. And why wasn't I doing it all along? you know <laughs> yeah. and then it's like three years later you're finally coughing out the second book I'm like oh right it's not always um you know the planets aligning so my books have taken as little as eight months and uh, um shorter for the like the nonfiction, which is really tiny right. and as long as um 10 years so solidarity decade sister I have been there okay Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some things, The Toymaker's Apprentice is my, uh, which is that? That is my fifth novel. And it's a historical fantasy a retelling of the original story of the Nutcracker and the Mouse King by E.T.A. Hoffman. Um, I thought it was gonna be my second novel. I realized over time that I was not the writer I needed to be in order to write that book. Yeah. So it took the intervening years to build the skill set, to build the perspective. And um, I'm very happy with the result, but yeah, it took its time. Well, I respect that you recognize that about your own writing and, and in order to do the story that you envisioned justice, that you took the time to do that. Because my first book idea is like, it, it's very dear to me. Um, it's like my baby. And I didn't, I didn't, I knew I wasn't ready, you know? And so I made sure I did the work to be able to write the book the way that I envisioned it to be. And now I'm finally there, <laughs> you know, in terms of time and experience. And I feel like I'm finally there. So I respect that you did that work. It takes time and you have to, yeah, you don't want to do it a disservice. You talked about Elizabeth Gilbert and the idea of, a, of an idea coming to you. Yeah. And it's like, okay, idea, come and sit with me and tell me what I need to learn so that I can do you right. Yeah. There's, you know, I think that's, that's real teamwork with, with your imagination. Yeah, no, I agree. So you have been doing this for a while now. Uh, what do you struggle with? as a writer at this point in your career? Uh -huh. Same thing I've always struggled with, getting it done. You know, like every book, to me, it's like trying to dive into a swimming pool and you're bouncing off the surface tension. You have to find the right angle to cut through the water. And so I'm working on um, multiple projects right now. So that's always a challenge is like juggling, mm -hmm. but, um, one novel in particular, like I have a really sloppy first draft and I haven't cracked that nut yet. I have a voice that I thought worked that allowed me to write the first draft. I don't know if it's the voice for the yeah. book. And I don't know why, like when it starts to work, it all lines up, you know, it's like those magnets, like, like I'll just sort of click into place and then everything, it makes uh, sense. And it hasn't done that yet. Yeah. And I think it's going to take me really sitting down and focusing, which is hard when you're juggling other things. And, um, and it's also possible that it's going to take patience. Like some of the stuff that I need hasn't happened yet or shown up yet. And then all of the turmoil and pain and drama of the past two to five years, depending on where you stand in the world, um, 
has taken up real estate, that's really thrown me off. Um, I was writing, I don't write a lot of contemporary anymore. Um, and I don't like to write high school and this is a contemporary high school thing. Um, so that's already a challenge for me, but then contemporary, the meaning of contemporary has changed in the last five years because the world was changing every five seconds. So right. what is it? So it became a, I'll just put it four years in the future. And then it became, okay, I'm putting it eight years in the future. And now it's like a post pandemic futuristic because, you know, by the time it's published and everything, it's going to be out of date and wrong if it's contemporary. I know I have one that I am calling near the one that I started after I retired, I'm calling near future. <laughs> yeah. In the not too distant future. Exactly. Because, because I, well, I do want to, I do want to manipulate some, some things in reality to, to make it work, but yeah, but it's like, okay. And then even, you know, if it takes me a year or two years, three years to write it, and then it's a year or two to publish it, like, how do you keep it relevant or current or yeah. Not Sometimes you can't. Really I wrote uh, my book Pasadena is like my last contemporary book. And um, the copy editor, by the time the book is like in copy edits, which is like that last step before it goes off to the printers, they were like, oh, she visits this Macy's in the mall that's not there anymore. And, <laughs> and they're like, what do you want to do? And my first thought was literally like, that Macy's is gone? <laughs> like, like, wow, I haven't been over there in a long time. And then I was just like, well, what is it now? And can we just leave it because ultimately who cares you know it doesn't have to reflect the world exactly but um yeah you can't keep up if you put right. if you don't put technology in your books people go that doesn't feel right if you put right. it in they're like what was that it's dated tomorrow exactly With phones <laughs> and yeah all so. things that I struggled with in my book as well so yeah that's interesting historical fiction is the answer <laughs> You have solid ground on which to That's build right. your world That's not and it's not yeah. going to change. <laughs> I love that. I might have to consider it. <laughs> That's fun. Am I tracking that you're leading a writer's workshop? Is that true? Um, okay. So I got that. Is that something that people have access to that you want to talk about or is it a side project that's not? Well, I can talk about a couple of things. Okay. Um, the first thing I'll talk about is like, so I got that degree and then I didn't teach for a long time, but now I currently do teach. I teach in two low residency MFA creative writing programs. Um, Great, thank you for that I, because low residency was the only way I would have been able to do it, so. Yeah, yeah, it, it, yeah, it's, it, it fits into people's lives a, a lot. It's still work, it's still a challenge, but um, so yeah, I teach at Goddard College um, in Vermont and I also teach at um, Hamlin University in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is a children's writing program specifically. And it's low residency. So you're on campus for eight days or 12 days. And then the rest is correspondence. Um, Hamlin is, Hamlin, it feels like almost the sister school to Vermont College of Fine Arts writing for children and young adults program that I did. Yeah. It's a very yeah. similar format. And a, a lot of the authors that I've met who are alum there um, you know, just, it seems like a very similar environment. And faculty there is, you know, some of that faculty That's is right. with us now and, and yeah. vice, yeah, yep. yeah. It, I mean, the kid lit MFA world is getting bigger, but it's still quite small. So yeah, we definitely are kissing cousins. Um, yeah, so I, so I teach that and then um, I do a few things on my own. I, the, I think the workshop that you were thinking about um, right now is I'm starting something called Story Forest. Um, I have um, a few interests and in, in things that I'm, I've been studying. Most recently, um, I just got my certificate in applied mythology and in um, the art of fairy tale archetype analysis. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I got my certificate in enchantivism, which um, um, was created by this guy, Dr. Craig Chalquist out of the Pacifica Graduate Institute um, in uh, Southern California. And that is um, a form of activism for introverts, we call it, where um, it uses deep storytelling, mythology, dream work, and environmentalism to bring about slow, positive change in the world. 
And so I've been looking at ways of incorporating all of that into my writing and into my uh, teaching on creative writing, because I think stories can heal the world. I am starting uh, next month actually with something called Story Forest, which we will use old fairy tales and folklore to deepen our writing practice. Um, it's follow the tale and find your story. And so um, the inaugural thing is, uh, offering is gonna be with um, Hedgebrook, the women's writing um, retreat on Whidbey Island in Washington state. And it's called Little Red Writing Hood. And um, we're going to be, and so that unfortunately uh, just closed uh, uh, for students, but it's a small group of us. I'll be offering it again through my own website, but this is a, uh, this version is five days. It'll, normally it will be over the weekly for eight, probably five to eight weeks. And we're working the story of Little Red Riding Hood and how it applies to your writing and your writing journey and unpacking things like, that is a story of a little girl who's bringing something to heal um, her ailing grandmother. So we'll talk about what's in your basket and what ill you are trying to heal. And, and then the distractions, the wolves you meet along the way and story structure following the path. So that's the inaugural offering. And I think in the winter, I'm going to be doing a smaller workshop maybe, um, and these are virtual right now in the world in the after. Um, it'd be lovely to do some of this in the woods somewhere, but I'm looking at um, offering something based off of the Russian folk tale of Vasilisa the Beautiful, um, or Vasilisa the Fair, depending on the translation you have, that is about that initial spark. That's a story of a, a beautiful young lady whose mother dies and gives her a small doll to help her meet the challenges she's gonna to have to confront, including a wicked stepmother and ultimately coming face to face with Baba Yaga, the witch in the woods. And um, so that's a journey of creativity. And we're gonna work on dolls that are um, touchstones for the novels or projects you're writing. I love all of that. And Yay. actually, and actually I have a lot of friends who will love all of that. So I will share that with them. That's probably more my, my writing for children and young adults community who are going to get super excited when they hear about that stuff for sure. But thank you. And so awesome. we can find information about those workshops, both, you know, whatever's in the near future and down the, down the line on your website. Yeah. If you go yeah. to shrielsmith.com, you'll see okay. Story Forest in the top menu and pull it down. And right now it's just got the information for Little Red Riding Hood. Um, but eventually, um, as I develop things and build it out, um, it might even get its own website one day, but we'll see. But yes, you can learn about it there. And if it's affiliated with someone like Hedgebrook or I'm part of a collaborative called Two Trees Writers Collaborative, um, it will link everywhere, so. What advice do you have for an aspiring writer who maybe hasn't written before? My advice for um, new writers is um, the number one thing is doing it, is sitting down and doing it. I can tell you that like I've been writing for years, right? Um, in some form or another. And I, I used to live with my brother and every morning, you know, he had the real businessman job in a suit and I was uh, timping at the you know, construction company. I had quit my real businessman job at Disney and uh, to write. And he was just like, when are you going to give this up? Like, what are you doing? It's not becoming, what are you doing? What? And and I kept doing it anyway. You know, my mom supported me. I didn't, I didn't need him to be like, I'm behind you, right? But um, uh, one day he, for my birthday or Christmas, I can't remember, he gave me a TV tray because he would knock on my door every morning on his way to work and say, have a good day. And he gives me this tray and I'm like, what's this? And he goes, every morning when I knock on the door, I see you with your laptop sitting in bed writing. And so this is a desk for you. And that was when I realized like a lot of people say that they wanna be writers or that they are writers. Um, you know, dreamers talk about being writers and don't do it. Writers sit down and do it. Authors sit down and finish it. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna be an author. You will be, you will be. I will. Will. Will be. And you're a writer and that's a huge step. Yep, I am. I'm getting close. I'm feeling really good about it. Better than I have in several years. So 
And a lot of that is because of this experience, um, both the, the book club and just having the infusion of positive energy about aviation, which is what I'm writing, but also like the opportunity to interview um, authors and, and spend a half an hour, an hour being mentored personally by you. I'm very, very grateful for it, Sheree. I feel like I could spend all day talking to you. Thank you so much for your time, really. We should spend all day talking to each other one day, Liz, because it's yeah. wonderful. And I have to say that that's another thing is building a writing community around yourself to support you. So that when your brother's like, what are you doing? You have people who go, I totally know what you're doing. And then one day your brother says, I support you and I know what you're doing too. Well, and that's, I, I have to give a plug for programs like Hamline and VCFA because I, it would have been a lot harder for me to build that community without having that, that camaraderie and experience of that network. And those are the people that I leaned on during COVID when none of us were writing, you know, yeah. and then like, you know, we established account accountability partners and it's like, I wrote 500 words today. Yay. It's amazing. <laughs> you know? But that's what it takes. But, it takes yeah. support and buddy system. And so find your group. If you write a certain genre, Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators gave yeah. me my first buddy, um, yeah. you know, Romance Writers of America, if that's your jam or mystery writers or sisters in crime or, you know, yeah. find your people, find yeah. your tribe. I'm finding my people. Thank you, Sheree. Thank you, Liz. This has been wonderful. Yeah, it has.